I have a brief comment with some questions for all of the presenters, but after my comments, I'll open it up for everyone from the audience, and then we can table my questions for throughout the rest of the conference. In Confronting History, George Almasi wrote, the way in which we lost our publishing empire was difficult for me to grasp at first, and at the time I could not have cared less. But later, after the end of the Third Reich, all sorts of nasty rumors about my father's role in this process were circulated in books, some of which collected every rumor that had been in current in Berlin's newspaper circles. The four papers today continue Mossy's effort to establish a narrative about the history of the Mossy family and to counter hearsay about the Mossy family and their legacy in Berlin. All four also recount the diverse ways in which members of the Mossy and the Lachman Mossy family have come to terms with the past. Roger, for example, has given us an excellent list of the attributes of those associated with the Mossy family today, uh, most notably ambition to contribute to society. The restitution efforts have resulted in impressive philanthropy in California, New York, Madison, and Jerusalem, and here in Berlin. Roger, I wonder if you could speak a little more about how the Mossy Foundation continues to invest in the family's progressive vision. After all, Mossy once said, every good person is a liberal at heart. In his presentation, Frank describes the arrival of Rudolf Mossy in Berlin in 1867, when he founded his advertising agency at the age of 23. Rudolf had just turned down a partnership in Leipzig at Die Gartenlaube. Rudolf is then followed by many of his Mossy siblings who arrive in Berlin and rise to prominence quickly. They become leaders in law, advertising, politics, and generally in the Berlin Jewish community. Frank, could you expand on the interconnectedness of the Mossy family in the Berlin Jewish milieu? How revolutionary were Rudolf Mossy's business techniques? And were there any social consequences for the fact that Rudolf Mossy's Anunzen Bureau was relatively new compared to other established German Jewish businesses? Frank also discusses at length the long shadow that is cast by Rudolf Mossy. And arguably all of us here today are paused in the shade looking back and forth and grappling with the legacy not only of the Mossy business empire and its, and its expropriation and dissolution during the Third Reich. Sitting with Irena Runga, and I think this is appropriate, Mikey, for your, your comments, in 1980s Berlin, Mossy said that he had heard over and over the lie that the Mossy property was willingly transferred to the Nazis or to non-Jews. Quote, in West Germany, that is asserted again and again and again, but it is a blatant lie. Opportunistically, Nazi strategies are being unquestionably believed. In January 1933, they got us. My father then left for Paris, but he was ordered back by Hermann Goering, and that is an interesting episode. Goering had said, Mr. Mossy, you must return. Otherwise, your former Jewish colleagues will be locked up. So my father went back, and that was a brave thing for him to do. I have actually read that he was to have been murdered because he would not go along with it. Goering had offered him the opportunity to Aryanize, which he declined. Picking up on Mossy's chilling recounting of his father's confrontation with Hamon Goering, we have heard from Elizabeth Wagner about the consequences of this decision to not cooperate with the Nazi regime. She's told us about the physical legacy of the family in Berlin, broken, missing, replaced, abandoned, simultaneously absent, but present. Having recently been out to Schenkendorf and to the foyer of the Mossy Zentrum, your conclusion about material loss and absence is poignant. And I thank you for those visual reminders. During my visit to the Schenkendorf estate, I was struck by the collapsing state of the estate. Uh, during our visit on a lighter note, we also climbed up to the belfry of the Schenkendorf Church. Hans Lachmann Mossy had given two bells to the city, one named Gerhard and one named Hilda. Uh, and Hilda was sadly melted down during the Second World War, but I'm happy to report that there's still a Mossy in Schenkendorf, calling out every hour on the hour. At the same time that you recount the absence and the presence of the Mossy topography, Elizabeth, 
you discuss George's warning about the fragile nature of liberal democracy and the role that the Mossy lectures play in publicly reaffirming the history of the family and their belief in a just society. My personal Mossy and refrain on this theme is though, quote, don't forget Mossy's law number 22, intellectuals who help the masses get kicked in the ass. Could you speak more on the role of the public intellectual today? Perhaps this could be described as a metaphysical or a spiritual legacy of the family in the city. I think everyone wants to hear more about the Mossy Lectures and how they've helped advance a pluralistic and a just society in Berlin. Now, Rogers and Mikey's papers both speak to the question of restitution and the legacy of the Mossy property. And this has been a long and an ongoing process for those descendants of Rudolf Mossy. In her impressive paper, Mikey Hoffman introduces us to the Mossy Art Research Initiative, really a path-breaking and an impressive collaboration of the Mossy heirs and numerous German public institutions, bringing in permanent researchers, but also collaborating with the public and with students. Mari works toward the goal of coordinating information related to the diaspora of the Mossy family art seized by the Nazis in 33-34. Mikey, can you give us a sense of how often public tips have been helpful in locating art? And do you, could you talk a little bit about Mossy's art collection in comparison to those from other contemporaries, like James Zeman or Edouard Arnold? Um, I think I'll leave it there. So we have five minutes for <laughs> questions. Uh, but please, if anyone from the public wants to ask something first, I think we should start there. Uh, first of all, thanks for all those wonderful presentations. And I just have a question relating to restitution and property. And I'm curious about uh, all the buildings owned by the press empire outside of Germany and what's happened to those, if anyone has information about that. Um. My uncle led a real estate restitution project in the 80s, and that um, was pretty successful in re, um, retitling uh, a lot of those properties. But as I understand it, uh, one, one of the interesting aspects of, of that project was that it was much easier to uh, retitle properties that had been in East Germany than in West Germany. In fact, it was nearly impossible to get West German product properties back because East Germany never signed the uh, reparations treaty. And uh, so the East German, uh, much of the East German properties were restituted back to the family and led to the establishment, for example, of this, uh, um, of the MASA programs in University of Wisconsin. When my uncle passed away, he gave the bulk of his, his fortune to um, the University of Wisconsin. Thanks. Just, I, I couldn't resist. I just put, connected a couple of dots. Um, in my uncle's uh, autobiography, Confronting History, he mentioned uh, during his formative years, of course, he went to boarding school and his life was controlled by bells. And it just occurred to me, maybe his father had in mind some kind of long-lasting um, bell uh, notion to keep his son on track for the rest of his life. Um, anyway, in answering your question, what is the Amasa Foundation do Sky. Uh, my brother uh, and I, uh, what we mainly do is we invest um, our foundation's resources in projects that we believe are consistent with um, the progressive ideals of the Masa family, but specifically are related to things which we are involved in, in the communities in which we work. And so it get, they are, they're already interesting to us and they're already um, some things that we're committed to. So one of the, proje one of the 
projects that we do is my brother's the chairman of the board of Leslie University, which has over 6,000 students in the Boston area, Cambridge, located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and its students focus on becoming leaders in education and human services and the arts, I think all very much related to uh, Masa uh, ideals. And, uh, and I've been involved in helping build uh, one, what has become one of the leading progressive um, theater arts organizations in the United States called the Berkeley Repertory Theater. It's a Tony Award winning theater. Um, I also have uh, been involved in something called the Math Science Research Institute, which ultimately we started um, the National Math Festival, which is the single largest celebration of math, the power and beauty of mathematics in the United States. Uh, a couple months ago, we hosted almost 30,000 kids. It's a very diverse audience of kids in Washington, D.C. Uh, we also do work in in the country of Armenia, um, where we rebuild medical clinics and, uh, and, and schools for economically disadvantaged people. The, the foundation there um, that we support serves thousands of people on a daily basis. Those are good examples of what we do. We're just beginning over the last few years to be interested in related to this project and how we can help um, energize the interest of the Masa legacy in Germany and in um, uh, in academic work, uh, research work internationally. Uh, so that's something we we're just beginning to do. Those are just examples of the kind of work that we do. Thank you. I'm uh, Andy Stangle, an alum of uh, Wisconsin, Madison. And my question may be a little peripheral, but I would ask uh, particularly the uh, um, uh, Frau Dr. Wagner and, uh, and uh, uh, Frau Dr. Hoffman, just out of curiosity, is, uh, did that uh, recent, I say recent, it's a number of years now, but the book and the movie about the Klimt uh, 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 Pardon? Maybe my question has been answered, yes? I wonder if that has given impetus uh, because it uh, creates a, uh, a broader understanding or at least a little learning experience about some of those outside the professional field of provenance. Has that uh, given some sort of a, a boost, if not a jump start, to, to an interest in this more popularly? That was a stumper. You're referring to the woman in gold. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think uh, for for my work and uh, the the Gurlitt case was much more um, pushing forward <laughs> provenance research in Germany, all over Germany, and um, and yes, that was the initiative I think for many projects. And as I said. It was not me who initiated the Mari project, it was Roger himself, the heirs uh, themselves, together with um, uh, Hermann Parzinger and um, Pfeiffer Pönsken from the, the head of the, uh, the former head of the Kulturstiftung der Länder. And all these people um, are involved in provenance um, aspects long ago for I think maybe 20 or 15 years. So I think it was not a special movie from uh, the US, but uh, the, the, the huge pro problem uh, in Germany and um, yeah, to, to conduct provenance research, you know. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna have to leave it there. So if you have other questions for the panelists, ask them over the coming days. I think we should thank them one last time. Thank you.